So uh, it, my life has been revolutionized by uh, foam sclerotherapy, and, uh, and so has that of my patients. Uh, yes, I got into foam sclerotherapy at the same time as um, Andrew Bradbury and I was involved in some of the uh, clinical trials that preceded the randomized clinical trials uh, starting in around 2001. So uh, I've had uh, about 13 or 14 years experience of this. So in the 20th century, we used to make incisions in the leg, uh, run big bits of metal down the inside of the vein and fish out the veins uh, in the calf, which is a lovely operation as long as you're on the giving and not on the receiving end. Poor old patients uh, found it rather a bruising and painful experience afterwards. These days, the, the patients look very relaxed and so does the surgeon. And uh, things are done completely differently, exclusively under local anaesthetic. Uh, we can still fix great big vein problems, um, rather small vein problems, and leg ulcers, no problem at all. Um, all that can be done with uh, foam sclerotherapy and other modern techniques. Probably, uh, just a brief show of hands, who's already doing uh, laser ablation of um, varices? Uh, so quite a few people already familiar with endovenous techniques. Uh, so the minimally invasive techniques um, have uh, changed considerably the, the life and lot of people with uh, venous disease. Um, radiofrequency ablation and laser ablation are really confined to fairly straight bits of vein, um, which um, is great, but you need to be able to do something to the uh, tributaries, varices, accessory veins, and uh, recurrent varicose veins, which are too convoluted to pass a catheter through. And foam sclerotherapy is, uh, is great for... Uh, that. So what are we trying to um, avoid? Uh, recurrence of varicose <coughs> veins, um, poor cosmetic results. I see many people with rather large slashes, vertical incisions in the groin, transverse incisions here in the thigh. The patient's going to wear those forever on their legs and some of them are not terribly happy about it. Collateral damage to nerves was a feature of uh, varicose vein surgery or even uh, damage to major arteries and uh, veins I've come across uh, uh, in patients who have been to see me. Um, do we know what these, the outcome of these treatments is? Well, we almost know. Uh, Lars Rasmussen has uh, commenced a clinical trial, actually quite a, um, a long time back, in which he randomised 500 patients to surgery, laser ablation, radiofrequency ablation, or foam sclerotherapy. And then he has followed them, and he followed them for five years, in fact. And this publication in 2011 was the first year's worth. But uh, we heard in talk in Paris recently... Um, about the five-year follow-up of his patients. And they measured quite a range of things afterwards, including how much pain there was afterwards. So here on this graph is the first 10 days after treatment. The vertical axis is the pain score. Different colored lines represent the different patient groups. And the green line and the black line um, are the highest. So that's laser ablation and uh, uh, surgical stripping of veins. And the, those two groups had the most pain. Uh, lasering in those days was with a bare fiber. Of course, that's changed as well. The modern fiber tips don't punch holes in the side of the vein to the same extent. Uh, the least pain was in the blue and the red groups, which are the radiofrequency ablation and the ultrasound-guided foam sclerotherapy. So the initial, uh, initially, the foam sclerotherapy and uh, radiofrequency uh, ablation ran out, uh, won out. Um, this is... Uh, the quality of life is measured by the Aberdeen varicose vein score. And as you can see, at one year, all four treatments ran parallel to each other. In fact, uh, for the next uh, four years after this, so five years follow-up, all four of those lines have continued to run parallel to each other. There is no difference in outcome as far as uh, quality of life is concerned. And in fact, there is, at five years, no difference in clinical outcome as assessed by the surgeon uh, between all those uh, four groups. So the outcome is the same. So all of these treatments achieve uh, the same thing, but differently. Um, Andrew has published uh, quite a large series, and I think Katie's going to summarise some of the uh, uh, longer-term follow-up data as well. But the clinical series that Andrew published had 977 patients. Uh, in it, all treated by uh, foam sclerotherapy here in uh, Solihull. And uh, this is one of the graphs that was published. Um, this is the freedom, uh, sort of the need for reintervention. And uh, that was only present in a small proportion of patients. So on the vertical axis, the proportion of veins not needing reintervention, starting out with 100%, uh, percent, and after 
uh, five years down to about 80% of patients were free of the need for re-intervention after foam sclerotherapy, which is uh, quite a good outcome, in fact, compared to some series. Um, I need to summarise for you about 170, 180 years history of sclerotherapy in uh, five minutes. Um, earliest sclerotherapy use was probably around uh, 1840, and initially uh, alcohol was injected uh, through the newly invented hypodermic needle. Um, unfortunately, that is excruciatingly painful these days, and although absolute alcohol is still used in the management of venous uh, arteriovenous malformations, it's not commonly used in the management of varicose veins uh, these days. Um, sodium tetradecyl sulfate has been um, used as a sclerodescent uh, since the uh, 1940s or thereabouts, and uh, a great proponent of it is the guy on the left, that's uh, George Fegan, and he had a very rosy view of the uh, outcome of, of Fegan's sclerotherapy. Uh, less than 15% of uh, patients had any recurrence. Stanley Rivlin on the right, his claim to fame, two claims to fame, he introduced the uh, phlebectomies through small incisions, originally described by Muller, and uh, he introduced that to the UK, and he also operated on Margaret Thatcher's uh, varicose veins. And he only had a 7% rate of recurrence, so he did very well. But I think they viewed the world, world through rose-coloured spectacles, and so perhaps we should refer to them as the flebosaurs. George Fegan uh, invented his uh, sclerotherapy in 1963 or thereabouts, and basically he said you had to have an empty vein, you had to keep it empty by bandaging over rubber pads and put an elastic stocking to make sure your rubber pads didn't move. You had to have uninterrupted compression for six weeks and you had to have a walking regime. Everybody had to walk three miles a day. Um, the compression for six weeks had some scientific basics, uh, basis, but the walking regime never had any scientific basis. It was based on the observation in one patient who walked twice around Dublin uh, on the day of her treatment and did very well afterwards. After that, everybody had to walk twice around Dublin. Uh, Sclerotherapy therapy was very effectively torpedoed by this chap, John Hobbs, who, uh, wrote a, who did a clinical trial, an RCT, in which uh, patients with truncal saphenous incompetence were randomised to surgical stripping or to Fegan's uh, sclerotherapy. Uh, George, uh, um, John Hobbs is still around. This picture was actually taken a decade ago, uh, but he is 83 now and uh, still in good form. Anyway, Feg uh, his uh, use of Fegan's uh, sclerotherapy uh, was um, assessed by... Um, what he called a successful outcome where the surgeon and the patient agreed that they'd got a good clinical outcome. So this is purely clinical assessment. No uh, duplex ultrasonography wasn't invented um, in the days of this clinical trial, which began in the mid-1970s. Uh, he found that at one year, surgery had a 96% good outcome and sclerotherapy, 91% good outcome. And that would parallel uh, George Fegan's uh, views on the subject. But after five years, the um, surgery was holding up okay. About 79 patients, 79% uh, of people were good, but only 30% of the Fegan sclerotherapy good were, group were good. And 10 years later, only 6% of the Fegan sclerotherapy uh, group were good. So... It really wasn't working very well. And after this paper, which was published in the early 1980s, everybody gave up sclerotherapy because it was obviously no good. Well, everybody except John Hobbs, uh, who continued to use it because uh, sclerotherapy actually is an extremely valuable method for treating varicose veins, curiously enough, but not for incompetent saphenous trunks. Which brings us to foam sclerotherapy. Various people have struggled to improve the efficacy of, uh, foam scler of uh, sclerotherapy for saphenous trunks. And foam has been injected uh, since the um, late 1930s, early 1940s. First report was uh, McCausland, who injected sodium, sodium moruate froth. Um, Orbach injected, uh, invented an air block technique where you introduce a bubble of air into the vein uh, followed by the sclerosant behind it and then later he said we should um, be injecting froth and this is a picture from his paper so in the syringe you can shake up, you can shake up some sodium tetradecyl sulfate uh, solution uh, get some froth, aspirate it into a syringe and inject it and he injected rat's tails with it and patients 
uh, and published both the outcome of both in the same paper and concluded that if you injected the sclerosant as a froth, it was four, times, four and a half times more effective than the sclerosant injected as a liquid. So that was the beginning of foam sclerotherapy, and it was used in, there are various papers uh, <clears throat> on that subject over the years. Uh, but uh, nobody had ultrasonography until uh, the early 1980s, and uh, it wasn't until the mid-1980s that ultrasound-guided sclerotherapy of varicose veins was described. In 1990, I think the first publication from Juan Cabrera, who is credited with inventing the sort of foam sclerotherapy that we're going to talk about today. First publication from him was in 95, but he published this paper with 261 limbs in them, up to 20 millimetres in diameter. Sorry, up to 261 limbs with varices up to 20 millimetres in diameter. And he used uh, foam sclerotherapy with a microfoam. So microfoam is foam, but with small bubbles. And he used a little whisk, a brush on the end of uh, an electric uh, motor to whisk up his froth, which was this. So very, very fine bubbles. And he injected that into veins under ultrasound guidance. And so this was the first description of ultrasound-guided foam sclerotherapy with microfoam, small bubble foam. Uh, currently, sodium tetradecal sulfate as fibre vein is the only licensed sclerosant in the UK. Everything else is now off. Um, as Bruce Gardner was saying, uh, in, I think it's 2012, you've got the um, license update. Um, uh, Fibrovane was approved for uh, homemade foam injection in the UK and subsequently in a number of other countries. Uh, polydocanol is widely injected in Europe, um, another, a non-ionic detergent. And uh, the manufacturers Chrysler in Germany have also licensed their foam in a, a, a number of countries. And Varisol was the, was the stuff that um, BTG were originally developing, um, and that's been licensed by the FDA as Varithena. Apparently, uh, the name of your drug can't suggest that it cures anything in the United States, so it is now Varithena, uh, not licensed in Europe or indeed anywhere outside the United States. Uh, NICE has uh, offered a view on... Um, uh, foam sclerother ultrasound-guided foam sclerotherapy in the interventional procedure guidance 440, February of, of uh, last year, and they say it works, good boys, uh, it works, but we have to tell patients they may get chest symptoms, visual disturbance, and we also should tell patients that they might have a heart attack, might have seizures, transient ischemic attacks and stroke, when in actual fact those complications of foam sclerotherapy are extremely rare, and if you look at the literature for varicose vein surgery, you'll find people dying of um, myocardial infarction and stroke, and similarly for endovenous um, laser and radiofrequency ablation. So um, I don't personally tell my patients they might have heart attacks or strokes after their uh, treatments. I think it's an extremely rare complication. Um, my, uh, I think uh, Mike Watkins is going to talk in a minute about the pharmacology of uh, um, uh, sodium tetradecal sulfate. Um, I've included polydocanol, which is, as I say, widely used in Europe, and we use it here for the injection of telangiectasis, in particular varices, which are not part of uh, this presentation. Uh, both of these are detergents, and they're active, destroy endothelium in the unbound state, uh, but once they become bound to plasma proteins and possibly other components of blood, they are inactive, and that's how they normally travel around the system before they're metabolised in the liver. Uh, they lyse the endothelium uh, very rapidly within about 20 seconds of injection. So as long as the sclerosant gets to the vein, before the blood gets to the sclerosant, then the vein is destroyed. Uh, so that's the problem. And um, interestingly, George Fegan had figured this out in 1963. That's why he invented his empty uh, vein technique. What problems do you get if you inject sodium tetradecal sulfate liquid? Um, uh, normally none, as long as you put it in the vein. If you put it a mil of 3% STS uh, liquid outside the vein, you get a hole in the leg which takes weeks to heal. So that's not a good plan. But this is a complication we see rarely these days because uh, most people doing sclerotherapy do ultrasound-guided injecting and you can immediately see when you're getting um, uh, sclerosant outside the vein. And we're normally injecting foam. And if you inject 3% uh, STS foam, outside the vein you get inflammation not a hole in the leg like that so the foam is actually much safer uh, to inject than the liquid 
polydocanol, if you inject that outside the vein, liquid, uh, liquid or foam, you get nothing. So no inflammation, no nothing. Um, it was originally in 1930 used as a uh, local anaesthetic. Um, so it has some advantages, but it's a more feeble sclerosant in actual fact. Common problems, thrombophlebitis, uh, is that we see fairly from time to time, deep vein thrombosis uh, less frequently, but occasionally. Uh, skin pigmentation over treated veins is quite a common phenomenon and will usually go all on its own. Systemic complications, uh, we see visual disturbance occasionally. This uh, will only occur normally in people who have uh, pre-existing migraine with aura. So they, if they get a, um, an aura uh, scotoma, they will recognise that as their normal um, sort of um, complication of uh, migraine. And uh, we have figured out a few things you can do to minimise the risks of people with uh, migraine getting, um, uh, getting a visual disturbance. Uh, some people get chest symptoms, get some tightness in the chest afterwards, but all of these are transient and have been shown to have no long-term uh, adverse effect. The only other thing I would mention is anaphylaxis. I've seen one uh, case of anaphylaxis in the last decade, but that's all. It is a, a very rare complication of sclerotherapy, but if you're injecting anything into anybody, you might one day have some anaphylaxis and probably should know what to um, do about it if it happens to you. So why does foam work? Well, we were saying that if you inject some sclerosant into the vein and it mixes with the blood, then blood inactivates sclerosant. But if you make foam and inject it into the vein, then you can show that the foam nicely pushes the blood out of the vein, so leaving the vein filled with foam for a short time, long enough for the sclerosant to uh, destroy the uh, vein. So in contrast to George Fegan's technique, where he would empty about a 10 centimetre segment of vein between his index finger and his little finger, um, if you inject and you get 10 centimetres of sclerosis, you can get perhaps 50 centimetres of sclerosis with foam sclerotherapy, if you're lucky. And uh, so that is why it um, is more effective. It doesn't mix with the blood so well. You can treat pretty well anything. Uh, Saphenous trunks, varices, recurrent varicose veins, very good with uh, foam perforating veins. Venous malformations, very good with foam. Best treatment for uh, pure venous malformations. We're not allowed to talk about it because it's an unlicensed indication for the sclerosis and hand veins and face veins. We can put foam in those as well. Uh, pretty well any patient uh, can have their treatment, uh, their veins treated with um, uh, foam. Uh, approximately 100% of the people who walk through my door with varicose veins can have their veins treated with foam. Uh, most of them have relatively small veins, being private patients, mean, median, sphenous trunk diameter in my clinic is about 5 millimetres, so they're modest veins, very easy to fix. Um, and uh, you can also treat all the tributaries and varices as well as the trunks. Uh, whereas I, I mentioned before, VVLT and radiofrequency ablation, you're really confined to using those in the saphenous trunks. Uh, less suitable patients, I've said those who are frail, infirm, immobile, they would derive rather little benefit from treating their veins, but we do treat people up into their 90s. People who've got a post-thrombotic limb, uh, it's often quite useful to treat to incompetent superficial veins and perforating veins in those patients. Um, and to patients on anticoagulants, well, lots of patients with atrial fibrillation are on uh, rivaroxaban or warfarin uh, these days, and that's actually not a barrier to treatment with sclerotherapy. It still works. Uh, it might be slightly more difficult. Uh, the only veins you shouldn't treat are the varicose vein, which is actually the only remaining vein in the leg. It is a ghastly error to kill off that vein. Clinical assessment, we look at the veins. Um, we ask, and I'm particularly interested if the patient's had a DVT or um, got some other active medical condition or if there's a family history of it because those are the patients who might uh, need some anticoagulation uh, as part of their treatment or following their treatment. Uh, estrogen treatment is contraindicated, uh, contraindications for uh, um, sclerotherapy of any type. In fact, uh, according to the uh, SPC for b uh, both polydocanol and STS, but in fact uh, phlebologists widely ignore that um, and continue to treat the patients anyway. Clinical examination, you need to know where the veins are, 
scars of previous surgery, sometimes helpful to know what may or may not have been done before, particularly uh, uh, skin changes of venous disease we want to know about, and possibly the other uh, things which patients think of varicose veins, such as lipomas. That's not uh, going to do any good injecting foam into a lipoma. Ultrasound investigation, uh, we need to know exactly which saphenous trunks, which tributaries, which perforating veins are part of the deal. And uh, we're fairly relentless these days. Any, if the part of a saphenous trunk is incompetent, we'll treat the whole saphenous trunk, all its tributaries, all its accessory veins. Um, we want to know if there's any deep vein uh, evidence of previous um, po um, deep vein thrombosis because those patients uh, can still be treated with foam stereotherapy, but we would want to give them anticoagulants afterwards uh, to prevent them getting a deep vein thrombosis again. Um, recurrent varicose veins, it would be quite nice to know what operation had been done before, but uh, as I say, uh, with foam therapy, it is less important than it would be with um, surgery. We're just going to treat absolutely everything which is participating in the varicose veins. So the ones which are easiest are um, the straightforward primary varicose veins, relatively young patients, no skin changes, uh, half an hour in my consulting room and those veins are cured. If they've got skin changes or leg ulceration, it might be necessary for it to work a bit harder. Sometimes they need two sessions of uh, treatment. Um, most difficult cases are in patients who've had many previous operations or got a venous malformation. And the most difficult ones are those who've got very extensive telangiectasis, which need a lot of injecting. Um, so these patients, this is possibly the easiest um, sort of complicated patient to sort out. Three previous operations, we just fill all of those uh, recurrent bits of saphenous trunk, near vascular, uh, great saphenous trunk in this patient, fill all of that with foam and in half an hour we've uh, done most of the work necessary to cure the patient. Do the same thing in this patient which, who's had various operations before but got three incompetent trunks, venous trunks between her two legs. Do the same treatment in her. She's still not happy because what you're actually looking at here, lots of telangiectasis and reticular varices and I normally delegate sclerotherapy of those to my clinical nurse specialist and it may take four or six sessions to get a really good uh, clinical outcome getting rid of those telangiectasis. Um, we do a DVT risk assessment for any of every patient along rather conventional lines and uh, give rivaroxaban or dibigatran for 10 to 14 days in anybody who I think is at risk of deep vein thrombosis based on this list, but basically those with la elderly patients, large veins, severe venous disease. Migraine patients, um, the main problem is that when they get up, they bend down to put their shoes or socks on, do a Valsava manoeuvre, and that seems to precipitate their... Um, uh, their visual disturbance. So if we get the, I normally get the nurse to get them to dress. However, patients sometimes expect things that we can't quite manage. Thank you.